Hey everybody, uh, it's Mike here, and today we're going to do a very special episode of Civics. Um, since the election happened, um, and we now know who the winner is, um, I figured we'd break down uh, the election and kind of see where that takes us um, as a country government and um, historically um, what's, what's going to happen now um, that we have a, a winner. Um, so to start off, a um, few key points from the election. Um, for those of you who either, if you haven't been paying attention, or if you have been paying attention, you just don't know really what's going on, or how to interpret it, or whatever. Um, one of the big key points from, from this election is that turnout can be really high. Traditionally, American elections have very low turnout for voters. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that is. Um, but this time, um, there was very high turnout. Um, you know, I, in the county I live in, uh, we had 93% turnout, which is insane. That's so high. Um, and I live in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin had 85% turnout overall of all eligible voters, right? 85% of the people voted, which is just incredible, because um, usually our, our turnout is in like the 30 or 40 percent. So the fact that we are in 85 is just immense for an American election. So that proves, right, that that turnout can be high. Um, but I would say, you know, honestly, we could get even higher. Um, you know, there's a lot of obstacles in the way for people who vote. Um, you know, especially this election, we had polling places shut down. The coronavirus was making it difficult to vote. Um, there was maybe some interference with the Postal Service so that mail-out ballots couldn't get there on time. And um, a, a judge had to look into whether or not you know, the Postal Service was specifically doing that on purpose and all that. So those are obstacles, obviously, that are in, in the way um, from certain demographics from voting. Definitely um, uh, black people in our country, um, a lot of obstacles are put in their way to vote. Um, so, right, eliminating those, higher turnout. Um, also, uh, we're one of the few modern democracies that don't have universal registration and uh, compulsory voting. Um, and I think both of those things are something that maybe we should look into as a, as a country. Um, when you turn 18, you're automatically registered to vote, right? Um, you know, American men have to be registered for the, for, the, um, for the draft when they turn 18. Why can't we do the same thing for voting? Everybody gets registered automatically. You're in. Um, and then compulsory voting, you just have to show up and do it. We could move it to a weekend. We could keep it on Tuesday, but we can make it a federal holiday. You go, and if you don't like anything, then you can just fill it, leave it blank. Just turn it in blank. At least you're voting. At least you're putting your word in there. You're choosing not to do anything. Um, um, and I think that's something that we should look into. Two, um, another big takeaway is Joe Biden may have won the election, but there are still 70 million people, right, who were voting um, to support him and his, um, his agenda, Trumpism. Um, is what they've been calling it, right? Um, uh, strong border, military buildup, um, economic toughness, as he calls it, right? All those things, and, and even the the racism and the the sexism and all that is all kind of bound up in Trumpism. Um, and there's a large part of this country that still supports that. So um, moving forward, seeing how that plays out with that large group of people in our country who. Um, who still supports that that agenda? Um, how do we change? The, how do how does Biden try to change their minds or tries to bridge that gap um, if he if he does try? Um, so that's that's going to be important to see what happens in the next uh, four years. Uh, also, right, we learned a lot about how young people vote. Young people voted a lot, um, and they were. There's several words you could use to describe, right? They were, they voted liberally. They were very politically active. And, you know, so they were out there um, making phone calls, sending letters to people, um, getting other people to vote. Um, they're obviously involved in a way that other generations have not been. Um, so that's really good for, I guess, in the, the, act, the activeness, a good part for the future. Um, the fact that they're willing to be so invested in the process. 
um, and that maybe that and hopefully that'll continue to happen throughout their lifetimes. That generation will continue to be incredibly politically active. And that would be a great thing. We want to make sure that we stay as politically active and involved as possible. That makes our democracy function better. Some other things to take away from, from all of this. Um, Mitch McConnell is still um, the Senate Majority Leader, um, for right now at least. Um, it all is going to come down to these elections in Georgia because Georgia has a different system for selecting their senators than the rest of the states. Um, they have a very large election with lots of candidates. And then the top group, there's like a top two for each seat, um, has to run off against each other. So those two elections are going to determine who has control of the Senate. Um, and so that's going to have a big impact on what Biden is able to do with his agenda as president, right? Um, the Democrats control the House still, um, but if they don't control the Senate, it's going to be really difficult for Biden to get his agenda through Congress to his desk so he can sign it into law. So um, watching those elections over the next couple of weeks is going to be really important to see um, the shape of um, the way the government's going to work out. And then also just how much um, how much is Joe Biden going to have to work with Republicans to get things passed? Um, if he, if they end up getting the 51 um, in the Senate, um, he's not going to have to really work with Mitch. He can just they can the Democrats can push things through without um, without having to deal with him um, and his power will be greatly diminished. So that's something to look into as well. Next up. Big shout out to Stacey Abrams. She, um, if you might remember back a couple years ago, she ran for the governor to be the governor of Georgia. She lost to Brian Kemp's, um, and there was some fishy business with that election. He was the Secretary of State for Georgia, so he was the one in charge of the election, but he was also running in it. Not great, kind of a conflict of interest sort of thing. And so after she lost, instead of kind of giving up and going, you know, going away, getting out of the public eye. She uh, started a foundation that registers people to vote, and sh her organization registered 800,000 people in Georgia alone. Um, and Georgia turned blue for the first time in a long time uh, because of that. So obviously, um, Stacey Abrams' efforts did not were not in vain, um, and that could end up being a big kind of end up being a big factor in how these runoff elections go in Georgia. Um, you know, Stacey Abrams was registering all, all sorts of people, but mostly they were black, people of color, um, people who traditionally vote Democrat. So that might end up playing a huge factor in those elections, seeing if they have the same kind of turnout as the presidential election did. Um, shifting to kind of what Joe Biden's doing now, now that him and Kamala Harris are going to be in the White House, and they know that in January, they have to start putting together what's called a transition team. So basically, they have to be prepared to the first day that they're that they're sworn in take over the entire federal government, right? They're 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 going to be the ones running the bureaucracy now. They're going to be the ones making these decisions, and so they need to be prepared to kind of seamlessly take over the day they are inaugurated. So they're getting together a team of people who are going to help them with that, right? No president does this job alone. They're going to have people that are by their sides helping them out helping them come up with people to be in cabinet positions, helping people come up with how they're going to implement the policies that they've laid out. Um, Joe gave a speech yesterday um, for his first speech as president-elect, and he started to lay out kind of what his plan was for the first couple of days he was in office um, and kind of and give some policy targets for people to kind of look forward to and hold them accountable for. Um, and so all those things are going to be handled by his campaign, but also his transition team. So the people that he has close to him while he's transferring from being the president-elect to being the president. So that's going to be an important factor to kind of watch and see who he's putting up, who he's going to say he's going to have as cabinet members. Um, because he did say he was going to try to have a diverse cabinet um, and not just uh, racially or um, gender wise, but also potentially politically. Um, saying that he might look to um, so certain Republicans to also be a part of his cabinet, to have a more of a broad coalition um, as his advisory board. So that's going to be interesting to watch. Finally, we have about a month and a half left of Trump. Um, what is he going to do with that time? Um, he, uh, some presidents, if they lose, they, they're called lame ducks at that point, um, and they don't do much. Others, they try to get a lot done really fast. Um, 
we don't really know what Trump's going to do yet. And he still hasn't conceded that he's lost. So um, seeing what he does and how he handles this next month and a half is going to be kind of the big story, I think, over the next few months, seeing what he's going to do. And then if he does actually give up his power willingly, which he's supposed to do, right, and he stops being president, um, where is he going to go? What is he going to do now that he's an ex-president, right? Oftentimes, um, presidents who are no longer president, they open up, they have a presidential library, they start a foundation, they still help the country in some way. Um, some part of me thinks that that's not the option that Trump is going to take, um, and we're not really sure what he's going to do. So seeing what um, he decides to do with his um, newfound um, unemployment, I guess, not that he's ever unemployed, he still runs his businesses or whatever, um, you know, what is he going to do with that time? Um, also, um, is he going to end up getting uh, litigated against? Um, now that he's no longer president, he's not protected by the position that he, hel he held, um, and he might be in, in, a, in a swarm of legal trouble over uh, numerous things that he did as president and before he was president. So that is also going to be kind of the big things in civics for the next uh, couple months. Um, you know, can you try a former president for crimes he did as a president? Or are they crimes when he's the president? Or is he specifically responsible? All these constitutional questions that we now have to kind of look into and see um, what's happening. And so if the, when those things do happen, I do plan on talking about these in the series so you can kind of think about them and, and understand what's going on. Anyways, thanks for, for listening to my recap of the 2020 election. Um, the Democrats won. Um, Trump is no longer the president. And um, there's only going to be more civics coming. So get ready. It's happening. Woo. See you next time for some more civics. Uh, we'll get back to our Supreme Court cases we were talking about in the last couple of videos. Thank you so much for watching. 